Good morning. As we gather for worship this morning, hear these words from Psalm 145. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving in all his works. The Lord is near to those who call upon him, to all who call upon him faithfully. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over those who love him, but all the wicked he shall destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Welcome to worship at Lawrenceville First Christian Church on this fifth Sunday in the season of Eastertide. Today we continue our celebration with all those who are gathered here in the sanctuary and all of those who are with us online of the good news. Christ the Lord is risen indeed. This morning we welcome Teresa Bench as our guest preacher. Teresa is a pastoral intern at Sandy Springs Christian Church and is finishing her Master of Divinity at Lexington Theological Seminary, hopefully by the end of this month, she tells me. She's also the daughter of our own Connie Worrell. Welcome, Teresa. We're looking forward to you hearing your message. As we prepare to open this worship service with prayer, we continue to hold in prayer the many people, both in our community of faith and in the world around us, who are especially in need of prayer today. We know that so many people are struggling with sickness or loneliness or discouragement, and we include them in our prayers today. We also pray for those we don't know personally and those we know who have needs that they may not have shared with us. May we all experience the love of God who is with us through each and every challenge of our lives as we go to God in prayer now. Will you pray with me? God of all creation, who created the spring beauty that surrounds us, we gather together before you on this first day of the week to align our lives to the life and teaching of Jesus Christ, our cornerstone. We come as people with a deep desire to learn and serve like Christ did. We are ready to receive your blessing and your direction today. God, we pray for guidance. Guide our hearts and minds in this time of worship so we may focus on you and not on the everyday concerns of our daily lives. When we are on the wrong path or fail to follow your direction, speak plainly to us and give us the courage to make changes in our lives. Help us to follow the example of Jesus, to care for those who are sick and hungry and lonely and in need of your love, and to bring hope to a world that desperately needs us. Strengthen our congregation and each of us as individuals so that we may become more effective in our ministry, in our service, and in our witness to the community. We pray all of this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus, the risen Christ, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Would you look underneath the seat in front of you, find a red chalice hymnal. And our first hymn is going to be page 72. Please stand if you're able and join us to God be the glory, verse 1 and 3.
morning. A few days ago, I heard the news that Pope Francis was being interviewed by a religious, religious reporter, and the reporter asked him if hell was real. And according to the reporter's article, the Pope said, no, hell is not real. Well, that reminded me of a story that I heard many years ago related to hell. It seems that in the city of Paris, France, there was a woman who showed up in the public square doing the most weird thing. She would walk through the busy place two or three times a week. In each of her hands, she carried a bucket and simply walked back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Sometimes she would sing a hymn to herself and then home. But mostly she was just silent, looking straight ahead to no one in particular. The buckets were not empty. The bucket in her left hand was full of live coals, as if she had just scooped them out of a fireplace. You could feel the heat if you got within a few feet of it, and you could see the sparks jumping out as if they were still live and red hot. On the other hand, on her right hand, she carried a bucket that was filled to the brim with water, just plain water. And as she walked, every now and then it would slosh over the sides so you could clearly see what it was. And there she was, two or three times a week, rain or shine, walking, walking, walking back and forth, sometimes singing, sometimes humming, almost as if she were in a trance. Children were warned not to go near her, fearing that she would cast a spell or frighten them in some way. Adults usually ignored her and passed by on the other side, fearing some kind of confrontation or, or comment. Most people thought that she was possessed by an evil spirit, or maybe she was simply crazy. But one day, a man dared to approach her and ask her a question. And she stopped walking for that moment he asked her why in the world was she acting like this? Why was she carrying two buckets, one filled with red hot coals and the other filled with water? Why? What was she up to? And here's what she said. She lifted her left hand and said, with these hot coals, I'm going to burn down paradise. And with this bucket of water I'm going to put out the fires of hell so that people will love God and follow God not out of a fear of hell nor for the reward of heaven but because they are grateful for his amazing grace and love so they will serve him out of overwhelming gratitude for what he is in their lives. So we, we come to a time in our service here of remembrance. And we are remembering the one who exhibited in his words and in his behavior and in his death and in his resurrection the unconditional love and grace of God. Whoever is here this morning is welcome to celebrate with us.
please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, in faith we come to this holy table knowing we can come to you in prayer for whatever our needs may be. We know your forgiveness and your healing. We know you hear our prayers of sorrow and despair. We pray in faith knowing you will answer us. Our taking of this bread and cup is the result of our faith knowing your son Jesus Christ died for us and in eating and drinking these symbols we lift our voices in prayers of praise knowing we are wholly yours may your nourishment give us strength courage and vision amen amen <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 11 tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me In the same way, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
Good morning. morning. Our scripture today is John chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. And it's the part where Jesus comforts his disciples. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show me the Father? Don't you believe that I am the, in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me, when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater than these because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father you may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Go with me in prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I grew up in a medium-sized town, East Tennessee, Oak Ridge, just outside of Knoxville. It was a nice place to grow up, a small town feel with the convenience of a bustling city just 30 minutes away. It was the summer of 1978, and my older brother and I were preparing to tour the Southeast with the Joyful Sounds, the first Christian church youth choir. Our youth choir toured during the summers for a few years when I was growing up. About 20 of us sang, and then there were parents and chaperones that went along with us. Janice Ketterer was our youth director, our youth choir director. She was good, but she was also very demanding. I was in middle school then, and other than church camp and visiting family, I hadn't been away from my parents for very long. That particular year, the tour was set to take over in the southeast, and we started out in Athens, Tennessee. Eventually, we would make it to Florida. The tour would last for two weeks, including a stop at some recreational park or the beach. We would prefer, perform in churches along the way, 
and stay in the church members' homes. Phyllis, my best friend and member of the choir, and I would stay together. I remember being somewhat nervous about staying in the house of strangers, even though I would have my friend with me. I wondered whether the house would have enough room for us or whether we could stay together. After all, if someone came to my house, some kid was sleeping on the floor or busting out their brother to get to the couch. How could people have enough room for all of us? I look back on those times now and note that everywhere we stayed had room for us and they were all prepared. Some even had more than one bathroom, which was a treat, so Phyllis and I could share. Miss Ketterer would always assure us there would be place for us in these homes and that the visiting church had prepared for us and that we would be welcomed. It's the fifth Sunday after Easter. You might wonder why the lectionary has given us a scripture that has returned us to the before the resurrection. Perhaps during this time after the crucifixion and the resurrection, we need to be reminded again that we have life eternal because of Jesus Christ and that Christ has gone before us to prepare a place. Let's take a minute and set the stage for this week's scripture. The chapter before our scripture, chapter 13, narrates the foot washing, the last meal shared by Jesus and his disciples, the departure of Judas to the dark side, and Jesus' betrayal by the loyal Peter. He has commanded his disciples to love each other, and chapter 14 picks up direct words from Jesus to his disciples about his impending departure. They are words of comfort, words of hope, promise, and plain speech, and little mincing of words as to what's soon to take place. Our passage opens with Jesus attempting to reassure his disciples. He has commanded his disciples to love each other and he has predicted his own departure. No wonder the 11 are upset and confused. Who is to be trusted? Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to a place prepared to you? I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, you are also. Verse 2 in the New Revised Standard Version says, Many dwellings are in my Father's house. In 1611, when the, new, the King James Version was written, it used the word mansion, which is what I grew up with. Eugene Boring and Frank Craddock tell us that the English word mansion simply meant resident residence with no suggestion of luxury. The point is, is that God has lots of room in God's household, and he has room for a big family. Our Lord's intention seems to be to comfort his disciples with the thoughts that nothing can cast them out of this heavenly house. They might be left alone by him on earth. They might even be thrown out of the Jewish church and find no resting place or refuge on earth. But there would always, always be room enough for them in heaven and a house with which they would never be expelled. Our scripture goes on to share the concerns of the disciples. Thomas, the one who likes to follow the rules, needs a plan, and is sometime known as the Eeyore of John. He tells Jesus they do not know where he is going and questions how they know, how they will know the way. Jesus replies with one of his most known passages in the Bible. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to God except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. 
This statement by Jesus is a promise, a word of comfort to the disciples. Jesus himself is all they need. There's nothing to panic about. There's no need to start searching desperately. And there's no need for a secret map. John is the I am gospel, if you weren't aware. And in John, we have seven of the I am statements. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection of life. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. I am the vine, the true vine. Perhaps in another sermon we'll go through the I am's again. Later in that same passage, Philip shares his confusion and need for answers. Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus, not quite happy with Philip, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me has done his work. There's a part of me that feels for Thomas and Peter. I mean, everything in their world is in turmoil. Jesus calls them. He tells them he's leaving. Judas has gone to the dark side, and the beloved Peter will betray Jesus. They've spent three years with Jesus. Now he is leaving, and they can't go. I think I'd be concerned as well. I feel a little anxious just thinking about how they must have felt. But wait, Jesus tells them, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If I were not so, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself so that where I am, you are there also. In God's wisdom, God sets a place for us, a dwelling with God, as Christ went before and prepared. We need to be reminded again and again that we have life eternal because of Christ and that Christ has gone before us to prepare a place. There are times in our lives when we are afraid we are anxious and unable to see the light for all the darkness in our lives. I'd like to share a story of a house and a promise of love. A few years ago, Netflix released a 2013 movie called Give Me Shelter. It's based on a book called Give Me Love, Give Me Hope, Give Me Shelter by Kathy DeForia. The movie is based on Kathy's life in an organization called the Several Sources Shelters, and it's in Ramsey, New Jersey. The movie's story is about a 14-year-old pregnant girl and her struggles that lead her to Kathy and the shelter that Kathy has created for homeless pregnant teens. Kathy's story is about discipleship and how she kept her house prepared and how this home provided a great light and changed young women's lives and legislation for the state of New Jersey. Kathy was married and obtained a psychology degree and an MBA from New York University. However, Kathy was married and was in an abusive situation. And when she ultimately decided to leave she did so with only the clothes on her back. The experience was degrading and frightening, and it caused her great suffering, but it prepared her for the weak work that God ultimately had in store for her. On the Camden, New Jersey streets, Kathy met other homeless people. She was especially drawn to the homeless pregnant teens who no longer had any options. 
With the help of a local church and the kindness of its members, Kathy was about to find a job. And she did. She found a job, and when she got back on her feet, she purchased a small house. And in that tiny house in 1981, Kathy received the call from God to open her home to the pregnant teens she met on the streets of Camden, New Jersey. Kathy's home would become the first of four several sources shelters. Kathy took discipleship to a whole new level with the shelters that were formed and the lives saved by the care and love for these young women. Kathy was given a $10,000 fine two years later for housing unwed mothers and their babies in her private home. This 15-month struggle cost Kathy her job and led to some tough decisions. You see, there's a law in New Jersey that says that you could only have one non-family member living in your home. And Kathy had three moms and three babies. The legal battle was relentless in the New Jersey State Senate, and governors became involved, the governor became involved, as did the White House and even Mother Teresa. She learned in those days how miracles do happen amid fear and anxiety. The bill passed and it allowed for more than one non-family member to be in the home. It's called the DeForio Bill. And in 1988, Kathy received an invitation to the White House to meet the president. She was given honors for her work in helping these young women. And as of 2018, Kathy and the sponsors and the volunteers that work with the shelters have helped over 20,000 young women and their babies. While the house had only a few rooms in the beginning, Kathy and other volunteers grew the house to have many rooms. It's like the rooms we shared during our choir tours. The rooms were prepared and we were welcomed. It's like the rooms prepared for us. Jesus has prepared a special place for each of us. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, so that where I am, you are there also. For it is life eternal, the gift we have been given. Amen. During this season of Easter Tide, as we celebrate the joy and mystery of the resurrection, you are invited each week to reflect on how you will respond to the good news you just heard from Teresa. If God is calling you to take a step in your journey of faith, perhaps now is the time. If you've been looking for a church home and would like to join our community of faith as we journey forward into the future, either by confessing your faith or transferring your membership from another congregation, you're invited to either come forward during the hymn or to speak to me or to one of the elders after worship. Let us stand now and sing verses 1 and 5 of Jesus Calls Us or the Tumult, number 337 in the Red Chalice Hymnal.
This morning, as we prepare to show gratitude to God for all we have received, we have a special opportunity for giving. We celebrate First Sunday food today and on the first Sunday of each month. It's a time to celebrate and bless all of the do donations we have brought for the Lawrenceville Co-op over the past month. May God bless the work of the co-op and the many hands that support it, and may the gifts of food we give this week and every week be multiplied to feed all those around us who are hungry. You're invited today to show your gratitude by sharing what God has graciously provided for us. You're welcome to place your morning offering in the plate at the back of the sanctuary or to donate on our website or by mailing a check to the church. Let us celebrate our tithes and offerings as we stand together to sing the doxology. several announcements this morning. First, let's thank Teresa for uh, her wonderful message this morning. <laughs> Next Sunday is Mother's Day, and it's also our graduate recognition. We know of four young people who are either members of or connected to our church who are graduating. Uh, this will also be in the egram. Paul Yoon and Perry Westbrook are graduating from high school. Annie Ballou and Raphael Evett Machado are graduating from college. So we will honor them in worship and celebrate with cupcakes and punch after. If you'd like to bring a congratulations card for any of the grads, we will also have a basket to collect those next week. Uh, mark your calendar for an all-church movie night on Saturday, May 20th. We're still deciding time. Uh, we'll be showing Greece. This was what the youth uh, selected. And the youth will have uh, refreshments for sale as a fundraiser. Uh, more details will be coming this week in the egram. If you're planning to register youth for church camp this summer, please talk to Marilyn or me after worship. We need to make sure all payments are in by next week so that we can get our check to the region. Let's Eat is a week from Tuesday at 6.30. Please talk to Anna if you are planning to go. Do we have a place? So tentatively, Ted's Montana Grill and seniors can eat off the kids' menu if you choose to. <laughs> Ask, for the small Ask for the small portion, yes, absolutely. So let Anna know if you're planning to join us. Just a reminder that the pulpit, continu pulpit committee continues to request that the church uh, engage in a time of intentional prayer each week, either at 7 p.m. on Wednesdays or at a different time if that's better for you. We have several birthdays to celebrate. Lynn Lane had a birthday this past Friday. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention it last week. Um, Barbara Bagwell's 95th birthday is this Wednesday, and there's info in this past week's uh, uh, egram about uh, an address to send her cards. Uh, Kayla Lee's birthday is Saturday. Are there any other announcements that I have missed? If not, I'll invite Teresa to give our benediction. <clears throat> into the rooms that have been prepared out goes the love know that life eternal is ours know that Christ has gone to prepare a place for us go in peace my friends knowing that you you have a place right there in those mansions of rooms Go. Amen. <laughs>